Morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jay Johnson. Here we are at the Sanctuary in uh, Royal Illinois. Uh, today is the 5th of September, 2021. We're, we as a nation are recalling some that event that happened 20 years ago. Remember September 11, 2000, 2001, and it was that uh, terrible day when all that tragedy happened in um, Washington, D.C., New York City, and in the rural countryside of Pennsylvania when uh, the United States was was uh, attacked uh, in those incidents. At that time, uh, the United States had, uh, because of that, that action that was taken against our nation, it's a lot of, a lot of countries around the world, most of the countries around the world were, were incredibly sympathetic to the offense that was taken against us. Uh, we do know that every time there's uh, a crisis, then their change comes about. There's a shift in attitudes, and uh, we have that in our personal lives, and we have that in our society as well. Uh, the passage we're talking about today, Jesus is bringing up uh, an issue about broken, being brokenhearted. People don't like to go through that, but that's part of life. Uh, these last several weeks, we've been talking about how God provides comfort and grace for us. We talked about uh, we talked about communion. We talked about baptism. Uh, last week, we talked about the fellowship, where um, we called it the office of the keys. People have the ability to forgive sins. Um, he tells Peter that uh, he has the power to forgive sins, and that is actually passed on to all of us who have faith. We're given that ability to uh, minister to the needs of others. Uh, God wants us to be, as a communion of, of the, the believers, we have that possibility. I'd like to share a couple things with you. Uh, today's passages are, are all talking about the brokenhearted. Oh, what does that mean, to be brokenhearted? Well, I, I know within each one of our hearts there's this profound sense of something that's, that's where people are going through some possibilities where it's just really tough, almost impossible. Uh, a number of years ago, it was about 30 years ago, I was uh, doing some training uh, for the pastorate and I, I did some work in a hospital in uh, central Illinois. And there was, uh, as we were in the hospital, we went around to, to see the various wards and we were taken to see this one guy, and his situation was was tragic. He didn't die, but his situation was very, um, very difficult. Uh, this individual, he was a professional. He was a trained counselor, and he and he took his uh, took his job a little bit too serious. He spent a lot of time working with a lot of people because, as he told us later, he thought I was their savior. He felt that he could do the work that was important for those individuals to come through their difficult times. But in the process, he weakened himself so much that, um, well, let's just say he probably made a very basic but you know, very foolish mistake. He was putting in an inordinate amount of hours, well over uh, 90 hours a week, which is that's ridiculous. He was working 90 hours a week. He was getting up early, seeing clients. He worked late. One night, uh, very late, he was, he was coming, coming back from work. He got in his car at the hospital and he uh, pulled out on the street. But dazed, overcome with fatigue, he made a bad choice. He turned the wrong way. And he ended up going the wrong way on a one-way street. Fortunately, it was at night, not a lot of traffic. But the traffic that was there were these big trucks. I mean, you get the idea. Um, he realized very quickly as he was going down the road that what's going on here? I'm in the wrong lane or what? Well, it was too late. These two semis were coming down the road right at him. And um, he got crushed. Um, he came into the hospital. He was there when I was before I got there before I started my, um, my three months there. And he, uh, they said he had, the body, the human body has 206 bones and over 50 of his bones were broken. 
Somebody said it was a lot more than that. I don't know. I didn't keep count. But he was in there for a long time. And he told us, he told us that it was a very foolish thing. And he told us the reasons why. Suffice it to say, he was a literally broken man. When they picked him up, the people that brought him in, they said they picked him up. He was like a wet dish rag, just kind of limp. All of his, well, not all, but 50 of his bones are broken. He was in the hospital for a long time. Not only were, was his body broken, but his spirit was as well. Because um, the text talks about how um, our souls find rest. When we say soul, the body is one thing that's broken, but the soul is our personality that it's not the spirit of God. It's not the spirit that we have. It's the soul. Uh, many people speak about the personality that as a person, it's sort of, it's snapped, it's crushed, it's beaten, it's downtrodden, and it needs a lot of care and comfort to renew it. I'd like to read these passages to you. Uh, this first passage comes from uh, Psalm 34. It says, Taste and see the, that the, the Lord is good. Blesses the man who takes refuge in him. Um, the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are, saves those who are crushed in spirit. At first verse said, taste and see. Uh, it's kind of like a taste test. You know, you put something in, you know, you go to the grocery store, they, they give these samples and you go, taste and see. I like that. I like that. And so here the psalmist says, try God out, see what he can do, taste and see if it works for you. And then it says, blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. The one who goes to the Lord and sort of camps there with him has this protection that that overrides everything. So the whole idea is that he's there and he will take care of us. The last couple of verses tie in very well with what uh, the example I just gave. A righteous man may have many troubles, but the Lord dwells, delivers him from them all. He protects all of his, all of his bones. Not one of them will be broken. Well, so much for that guy that was in the car wreck where he busted 50 bones. But this is, a, this is an encouragement that God will take care of those things as we... You know the old saying, God is my co-pilot. If he's riding in the car with us, if we're thinking like he wants us to think, yeah, 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 people say that. What does that mean? How do we get in the, how do we get in the, um, in the position where we really uh, want him to be there with us? I'd like to read this next passage from uh, Psalm 147. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. Exile, you know what that means? People have been kicked out, been told to leave. They got to leave the, the promised land. Now they're coming back. How do you think they feel? They've been under some pressure for a long time. Their exile, it says he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. The next verse is a kind of an odd one. I'd like to read it. I'll read these two verses together. Verse three says, he heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Why does God put that in there? It's put in there because it shows that there's no limit to what God knows. There's no um, restriction on the people he can help because he knows everything about everything, which means he knows everything about you. If he knows the number of the stars and knows the name of each star. Yeah, well, how, long that, how long is that going to take God to name the stars? Um, about that long. That's what God does. Now, I want you to get in, get in, get a grip on this because God knows what we need. He's simply waiting for us to give our attention to what He has to say. These two first two passages were from the Old Testament which lays out kind of the ground rules, God knows. The next verses come from Matthew 11. And this is about Jesus who knows God. He knows God and God knows him. And when Jesus speaks, he tells people what God knows. Here's the passage. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and the learned and revealed them to little children. 
He's hidden these things from the wise and the learned. We think the wise know everything. <coughs> Sorry. We think the wise know everything, but they don't. The learned know a lot of things, but they don't know what God knows. And it says, God reveals them to little children. Scripture tells us that God wants us to be childlike. Not childish, but childlike, always ready to learn. All things have been committed to be by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. When it has that idea about being revealed, He shows them the secret things. He talks about all those secret things that happen to be within us, that can be within us, if we learn. I'm going to, uh, I'm going to show you, uh, uh, I'd like to share this with you. Let me finish reading this text. Come to me, all you who are weary and, and burdened, and I will give you rest. Verse 29 says this, Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble of heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Now, in verse 29, that word yoke, the word yoke, a lot of people, a lot of young people have no idea what the word yoke means. Um, I've got a little sketch of it here. For, in, in Jesus' day, it was a pretty common thing for people to know what a yoke was because they used an instrument like this. A yoke, I think uh, most of you older folks that see this know what, the, know what this is. Um, this was an apparatus that was put around over the, uh, the necks of work animals, cattle or uh, oxen. And this, this was put on their necks and it restrained them from breaking away one from another. They would have an older one, uh, they would have an older one in this one and a younger one in this one. Well, wherever the older one went, the younger one had no choice. And so with time, the older one, as the older one was guiding the way, the younger one would likewise follow. And after a time, the younger one would be, he would, they would work in unity, in harmony. They would get their job done much easier and without much contention from the younger one being aided by the older one. Now, what, is, what does this mean for us? Well, we're not going to carry these things around on our, on our necks. But we are going to carry some restrictions because God gives us restrictions all the time. In fact, everybody that's listening to me right now has certain restrictions that are placed on them all the time. Some people chafe and don't want them. Chafe meaning it rubs their neck wrong. They just want to get out of there. They're willing to break free. They'll, just, they'll do anything to get away. Some people recognize that you need the yoke to accomplish the task before you. I'm going to give you a couple examples. Um, sometimes people have yokes or restrictions that are put on them. I'd like you to think about, as I speak here, what are the restrictions that are placed upon you that you admit, say, I really need that. Uh, what are some of the restrictions that are forced upon you that you don't want? And you say, I'd rather not have that. And I believe that God in his sovereignty, I, don't, I know this for a fact, he knows what's absolutely best for us. Are we willing to listen to what he has to say? Um, when we talk about people that get married, it says they must be equally yoked. They, they must be equally yoked. It doesn't mean that you carry one of these around in your kitchen and, and to the store but it means you must be a one accord in the places you go. You must be so joined that you have a concerted effort to do that. Sometimes the yoke is put only upon you, but it has a restriction upon you. Um, here's a story that uh, my wife tells. Some of you have heard this before. Uh, there was a young man that uh, they knew uh, they went on a uh, mission trip a few, few summers ago. This young man was uh, in a car accident and um, he had severe damage and he was limited in the way he could walk, the, uh, 
and talk and the way he could move. And um, he obviously had this, this strongly evident uh, disability. And he was, he was there while they, uh, the kids that went on the trip spoke with him. And one of the kids said, do you, wish, do you wish you didn't have that restriction? Would it be better if you didn't have that restriction? And through um, a difficult time of speaking, he admitted he, he, was, he wasn't regretting that the restriction was on him, either his movement or his speech. He said, because if I didn't have that restriction, I would have been really proud in my actions. He would have done exactly what he wanted. But when those restrictions were imposed, he knew that God was the one that would carry him through. That's what the passage says. He knows, he knew that the presence of the Lord Jesus with him would be the one that carries him through. There are those people that we know many, evidently many of you that are listening, when you entered into marriage, you entered to, into a relationship where you were limited, you were restricted, you could only go certain places with this individual. And by God's grace, you have continued to be a blessing because of in those restrictions, God gave you more of an abundance that you would have never had outside of those restrictions. I'd like to read this. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. That word learn, this is, I, I believe in this entire passage, this is probably the most important uh, word in, in the text. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Now the opposite of learn is to teach. Now, bear with me on this. When we have teachers teaching in a classroom situation or even pastors, or uh, I'm, I know uh, I've got several cousins, they work as, uh, they worked as journeymen. There's a number of my cousins that worked as uh, electricians. And they had these instructors and they did, they, did, they learned a lot, they learned their profession by paying attention the restrictions. You know what it is. You got to go to work. You pay attention. You take your classes. You take your tests. You come out. You do the practical applications. And gradually, gradually, over a few years, three, four, five, maybe six years, you learn the trade. And now you're you're the expert. And that's going to be the direction. That's going to be the that's going to be your uh, meal ticket for the rest of your life. Not only that, it's going to help so many people and the things that they need in their homes and their shops and their houses and their buildings. You're going to be the one, they're going to be the ones that, that, that performs all these tasks for them. But it says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Um, I'll go back to this image of this yoke. Do we want to be, do we want to learn what it means to follow Christ? Now, there's a lot of people say, oh, that's a bunch of hooey. I don't want that stuff. And they, they avoid. And God in his sovereignty very often pulls people back into the, into the place where they can no longer escape. They're going to have to learn. Because he doesn't want that anyone should perish. He doesn't want to lose anybody. And that's really important. We have been, we are being prepared. Uh, there's a really cool idea. I'll try to explain this in very few words. And scripture talks about the idea of being saved, saved. That means to know Jesus Christ, to come to a, a deepening relationship. And obviously be, by being saved, the, uh, we come to a knowledge that will, by which we can attain to heaven. That means to be saved. But there's another couple of, there's the same word applies to different kind of saved. It means that when we're, when we come to faith in Christ, it's not already complete the whole thing. Um, for example, if we graduate from college, we graduate from college and we know a lot of stuff. And so what do we do with the stuff we know? Well, we can go out and use it. 
But you know what? Once we start that career, we keep learning. We keep learning more. We're much smarter and better than when we first got out of college. When we're married, we're married. We get married, we put the ring on our finger, we, there's a date on the calendar, we celebrate our wedding anniversary, but you know what? Uh, they tell me, experts have said, I've, I've read studies on this, they say you're really, not, you're really not united in marriage until you've been married about eight or nine years. Because you keep going through the process of learning more as you're yoked to Christ. Christ says, take my yoke upon you and learn from me for I am gentle and humble in heart and you will find rest for your souls. It doesn't say rest for your bodies and it doesn't say rest for your spirit because your spirit, well, that's a whole other issue for another time, but it says rest for your souls. All of us we have these, these parts of us that most of the time, much of the time, and for some of us, all the time, there's always this uh, unquietness, this disquieted, frustrated situation. But Jesus says here, you may want to just plug in the word for soul, put in the word personality. It's, it's who you are that's on the inside. Uh, there's an interesting phrase. It says... Um, um, this idea of souls is the ent one's entire affection, their personality, that which belongs to the person himself. In other words, it's unique to that individual. There's not a carbon copy in anybody else's life. It's what's unique to that individual. Who's ever watching this, you have your own personality. God is forming that so that it's going to be complete in the way that God himself wants it to be. I have a personality. God keeps helping me to tweak that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm getting older, but you know what? My personality is shifting to become more like that which God wants it to be. So he ends up by saying this, my yoke is easy and my burden is light. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. Now that yoke may look pretty heavy. This would be a pretty heavy thing to carry if you, you had to carry it on your, on your neck and shoulders, but you don't. There's a task that the Lord has uniquely planned for you. He's got a yoke for you, but I guarantee you that when those who walk with Jesus, and here's the point, you're in one side, Jesus is in the other. Jesus is the one that's pulling with you, pulling for you. He's the one that you're with. And if you were in a yoke like this, he would be talking to you as you listen to him. He would be telling you precisely what to do. This is not the best example, but it is an example that I appreciate because sometimes I'm stubborn and I need to know where he follows. I'd like to finish with one small example I've shared this with several of you before. Uh, when I was uh, when I was nine, uh, I was on the grandpa, my grandma and grandpa's farm, and uh, there was a lightning uh, strike the night before. When big winds came through, knocked over power poles, that sort of stuff. Not knowing much about all this uh, electricity and down wires and stuff, I foolishly, unknowingly, ignorantly grabbed a hold of a live wire that was hanging from a, a telephone pole or a, a light pole. I could feel, I could feel the shock come through my body. I could feel it. I was, I couldn't let go of it. Grandma and grandpa came along and saved me. They released me from that. They pulled me out. They got me down. And my grandma held me in her bosom. She held me right like this. And I vividly remember how important that was. And she kept saying, she kept saying, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. You see, at that moment, she, I, was, I was saved from being electrocuted. I was saved. But those words that Grandma told me, it's really sweet. She said, it's going to be okay, Jay. 
it's going to be okay. 25 years later, um, 35 years later, um, I received word about a shocking incident. I received word that my father had just passed away in Illinois. I was living in South America. My dad was, he had passed away in Illinois 35 years later. And I, I expected to be totally shocked when I heard that news. But you know what? I wasn't. The news saddened me, but there was no traumatic effect on my spirit because as soon as I heard those words, I sat back in the chair, kind of like I am right now. I sat back and guess what words came to me? The words that came to me were the words of my grandmother. Because 35 years before, she said, it's going to be okay, Jay. It's going to be okay. The instant that I, that I heard that news, that, that um, I'll call it the heartbreaking news, the broken heartedness that would come from that, I immediately had the confidence and the, and the presence of mind to remember those words that Grandma had taught to me because the, the Holy Spirit had laid those on my grandma's heart because as she held me there in her arms, she gave me those words of affirmation, you're going to be okay. And as soon as that happened with my dad, 35 years later, in 1994, I had this profound sense of peace that came over me. And I knew, indeed, things are going to be just fine. They're going to be okay. My prayer for all of us in these difficult times right now is that we would recognize that God's presence is meant to be with us because he mends the brokenhearted and he heals up their wounds. That's what Jesus is meant to do for you. My prayer is, brothers and sisters, that you would take that to heart and you would live and you would walk in those means. Blessings to you.